John, as they were going back to Jerusalem, one of them said to the other, Did not our hearts burn within ourselves as he opened unto us the Scriptures? In other words, the Scriptures of the Old Testament are dead without Jesus. But when Jesus pointed to himself in the Scriptures, they came alive, and these men's hearts burned within them because they finally understood the meaning of Scripture because they saw Jesus in the Old Testament Scriptures. Now, in our study this morning, we want to take a look at one of those verses from the writings of Moses that points to Jesus and his relationship to the text. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. By the way, for those who are watching on television, there are many Christians today that say we're New Testament Christians. There is no such thing as a New Testament Christian. You see, folks, there are Bible Christians. And the Christian world today is repeating in many ways the same mistake that the Jews repeated. Because the Jews did not see Jesus in the Old Testament. And Christians today can't see him either. So what's the difference? The fact is that the Old Testament is full of Jesus. On every page, every line has Jesus in it. Now, Deuteronomy 8, verse 3 is talking about the manna. And the reason why God gave the manna. Let's read that verse. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says there, God speaking uh, actually through Moses to Israel, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. What did God feed Israel with? Manna. Why did he feed them with manna? It was good food. Yeah, that too. But that's not the real reason. Notice what it continues saying. That. Now comes the explanation why God gave the manna. That he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds in the mouth of God. Why did God give the manna? Because he wanted to teach Israel that the manna represented what? The word of God. And man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The manna represented the word of God. By the way, the Apostle Paul tells us that that food was spiritual food. If you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul is reminiscing about the history of Israel. And I want you to notice what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all, all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same, and now notice this, the same spiritual food. What was the manna? It wasn't physical food only. It was spiritual food. All ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the, drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. I wish I had some time this morning to talk to you about the rock episodes in the Old Testament. Wow! What messianic prophecies those are. You see, maybe I'll just do a little sideline here. And then I'll talk faster and get caught up. You see, the rock represents Jesus. The rod represents the punishment of God, the judgment of God. Every time that Moses raised his rod and the rod brought a, a judgment of God upon Egypt. So the rod represents just judgment, even when we use it for our children. Isn't that right? If we still use it, that is. And of course, the water that comes from the rock represents the Holy Spirit. We've all been made to drink of one spirit, the Bible tells us. And if you read John 7, 37 to 39, you're going to notice there that the water that Jesus says, come to me and drink, and he says, the water that comes forth is the Holy Spirit that was poured out on the day of Pentecost. So 
So the first rock episode, Moses is commanded to strike the rock, and the rock will give its waters. The striking of the rock represents the judgment that God uh, that fell upon Jesus. And as a result, he was able to pour out what? The Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But there's a second rock episode. God told Moses, now you don't strike the rock, you speak to the rock, and the rock will give you its waters. But he struck the rock, giving the impression that Jesus was going to have to fall under the judgment of God more than once. You see, now to get the Holy Spirit, Jesus doesn't have to die again. All we have to do is ask, and we will receive. All we have to do is pray, and the rock will pour forth its blessing. Now let's get back to the manna. John chapter 6, verses 48 through 51, explicitly tells us what the manna represented. We notice that it's spiritual food. It represents the Word of God. But now Jesus is going to make this explicit. It says there, beginning in verse 48, Jesus is speaking, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give, now comes a very important point, and the bread that I shall give is my, don't, don't miss that point, don't forget it, we're going to come back to it time and again. Jesus says, the bread that I shall give, which is the manna, right? Because it comes from heaven. The bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. By the way, who is the Word of God? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the manna, which represents the Word of God, actually represents whom? Jesus Christ. What specific aspect of Jesus Christ? It says here, Jesus speaking, the bread that I shall give is my what? My flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The manna represents specifically his flesh, which was going to be torn for the salvation of the world. I love this statement from Ellen White in the devotional book that I may know him, page 38. Ellen White says, What speech is to thought, so is Christ to the invisible Father. The Father thinks, and Jesus does what the Father thinks. He's the expression of the thought of God. He is the Word of God. Now you're saying, where are you going with this idea of the manna, that the manna represents the flesh of Jesus? Well, in order to fully understand the manna, we have to go to where God sent manna. Exodus 16, right? So let's go back to Exodus chapter 16. We're going to list some incredible things this morning about the manna. Things that perhaps we haven't seen before. In the manna, you have a fabulous messianic prophecy. We usually think that it only exalts the Sabbath or it teaches health reform. Yes, it does both of those things. But there's more in the manna story than just health reform or the Sabbath is the day of rest. Exodus 16 you remember that manna was rained from heaven? How many days a week? Six days a week. You're right. Now, when the manna fell on Monday and people saved it for Tuesday, what happened to the manna? Two things. Let's read it at Exodus 16, verses 19 and 20. Exodus 16, 19 and 20. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses. But some of them left part of it until morning. Now I want you to notice this. And it what? Bread, worms, and stank. And Moses was angry with them. How interesting. Let me ask you, if you go to the grocery store and you buy a loaf of bread, and you have it in your cupboard for a week, it breeds worms and stinks. Come on, the men wouldn't know this. 
What happened?